Token Metrics is a cryptocurrency investment platform that helps users leverage machine learning to become better crypto investors. Our in-depth analysis helps eliminate the emotions of investing, find profitable investment opportunities, and filters out scams. Learn more at tokenmetrics.com. We are live. Welcome to the Hidden Gems edition of the Market Update. I'm your host, Bill Noble. If you need a roadmap in crypto, subscribe to this channel. If you want to know what to invest in when the selling stops, subscribe to this channel. Turn on alerts so you know when we're going live. And if you like the content and my colleagues, please give us a thumbs up. All right, this show is brought to you by tokenmetrics.com. So for today's agenda, I am going to go through the market update. All right, and then we are going to go through NFTs, right? Because NFTs and risk assets are not correlated. We're going to get a critical update about the DeFi markets. And then we're going to get hidden gem projects that we really like that are something that, you know, is up and coming because the best time to do homework is in a bear market. All right. So without, without further ado, let's just take a look at who's on the stream. Okay. Ali from London is here first, right? We have Sally soul. Hi Madrid. All right. Is in the house. All right. And also from Togo. So let's jump into your market update. Okay, every big mistake, dot, 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 starts with denial, okay? So don't go long into a long weekend. Upcoming this weekend is the U.S. Memorial Day holiday. So let's talk about how we're going to play this from a tactical level. All right, what happened today? What happened this morning? You woke up, eat down 8%. Okay, here's what happened. Glass node, okay, ETH perpetual funding rate, it's all green, right? Everyone is long ETH, probably hedge funds long ETH, right? Looking to maybe add on leverage in case the ETH merge comes out. Okay, it's not a terrible strategy, but, you know, if these guys get stopped out, it can create these air pockets to the downside. The same thing happened in December. People tried to get long, right? these levered instruments and then price didn't, you know, price went down. So as long as this is green, you have to be vigilant. You know, from listening to me, you have to be vigilant no matter what. One thing I think is interesting is that people don't think they have to be hedged in ETH or macro hedge funds are not making short bets in ETH. How do I know that? Well, because open interest in ETH futures, the blue line seems kind of muted. Everyone's interested in being short Bitcoin, but no one's interested in being short ETH. We know why. However, what I will note is when ETH open interest does expand in these sort of futures, uh, the cash margin futures, you know, when ETH open interest does start to rise, ETH falls out of bed. So as long as no one is interested in shorting ETH via these futures, it's okay. But the second that wave starts coming in, you have to be careful. So levered guys got stopped out today. And the next question is, will macro players come in and get short? Stay tuned for that. Okay, let's talk about tactical levels. Yesterday, we talked about a, a DeMarc line at 28,357. That held the support. You know, we talked about everybody getting short, okay? Getting greedy into weakness. We also talked about forced selling. Once the forced selling is over, it just levitates back up. I would expect this to continue until Monday night, right? Where I think a down move is going to start. Who knows what they could do on the upside in between that. For Bitcoin, resistance is at 29,627. So as I said, you know, beware the failed rally. This could be the rally that fails or they could take it a little higher. Who knows? Bottom line is when you sell green, when you see green, sell, not investment advice. Okay, Bitcoin has supported 28,300. So the AI and the DeMarc levels had the same number. 
And in the event that they want to get wild, 33,000 is support on the upside or 31, right? The point is you want to have the ability to sell it as it goes up. I'm not exactly sure where those levels will be, but you want to make sure your positions are reasonable enough so that if it does go up, you can reduce risk or hedge if you need to. Now let's talk about the last rally. Remember that from my list of when does something, you know, when, when do you get ready for something big? Okay. So tokenmetrics.com, we have this new markets page. Okay. This shows uh, volatility. So as you might notice, the market hasn't done anything for a while. So volatility has the yellow line over here in the corner has gone way down. So I said, hmm, that's interesting. What happens when it gets to the bottom of the range? Well, in December, volatility got to the bottom of the range. And then Bitcoin had one more rally, this arrow here, and then boom. And then historical volatility over here in March, April, right? It bottomed out. Bitcoin had one last rally and boom, or, or the market did. This is total crypto market cap, right? So volatility bottom so what does that mean everyone goes to sleep we're all going to make it turn your back on the bear then there's a final rally everybody thinks it's okay and then slam okay so beware the failed rally don't get sucked in don't feed the bear the more boring it is the worse it could be if the next rally failed okay eth some good news so wave five we were looking for an emotional downtrade in eth we got it Wave five came in and it hit support near 1700, did an overshoot, and now it's bouncing. So, you know, the market's probably going to go lower later, but for the moment, it's okay. They all got emotional and hopefully we can go on vacation. Okay. ETH also has a DeMarc 9 with support at 1766. What does that mean? Well, it could mean that ETH just going to turn around and go back up. This is a 90 minute chart. So, you know, maybe we got three days of stability. Okay. Now with this nine bottom, okay. The way DeMarc works is that's the, that could be the first part of a trend. Then you could get a counter trend rally. And then if that rally fails, then it goes a lot lower. So bottom line, beware the failed rally. Hopefully we get to go on vacation, but if there's a failed rally anywhere between here and Monday night, look out. Kind of hoping for stability, personally, three more days of calm. Okay, let's talk about ETH on a broader structure. 1850 is going to be a key pivot, right? So they, they burst below it, and then they came back above it. So if ETH is above 1850, it's probably okay. If ETH is below 1850, risk is 1500. Now, I said this with 1950. And as bear markets do, they taught you, right? I said, oh, watch out for 1950. Watch out, watch out, watch out. It sat there. It hit the number like, I don't know how many times. I stopped talking about it. And what happens when I stop talking about it? Boom. Down 10% while you're sleeping. This is the power of bear markets, right? They just, they just sneak up on you. 1752 was a level from our AI related support and resistance. If you're looking for all these levels throughout a wide variety of altcoins, go back to yesterday's video where we covered these levels for every coin. But the bottom line is ETH may be zooming around in a range between 1752 and 2000. Now, if you ever saw a 1900 or 2000 again, I would be thinking that's where you reduce risk. Or if you're a short seller, you would start to get active. Okay, just as a reminder, ETH on a monthly chart, right? Okay, so April was the 13 top, all right? That means there should be a, a trend lower. These green numbers mean that it could last five more months. So that means May, right? Five, June, six, July, seven, August, eight, September, nine. And maybe one more for good measure in October. Now you're like, okay, Bill, well, I, I don't understand. I, I can't process that. All right. So I'm not an expert. We will hear from the DeFi experts later, but I'm actually looking at something really weird. Ave versus Bitcoin, right? So I guess you could call it like the biggest bank in the DeFi system. 
versus the biggest monetary asset in the system, me. Okay. So this is a five wave structure. There's a trend line. And in the bottom right hand corner, we could be set up for five of five. Now, what is that? So let's zoom in here on this last recent, this is April and May. What's five of five? Well, it's about as emotional and, and just straight down. It's like total panic. Now I'm looking at this. I'm like, okay, here's an Elliott wave count. And maybe this makes Ave versus Bitcoin go down 45%. Just straight up charts. What would make Ave go down 45% versus Bitcoin? Okay, I don't know the answer to that, but I'm guessing it would be some kind of liquidation event or problem with collateral, just like 2008. So first you had Luna, then you could have Ave for whatever reason. Now, Ave and Luna are different, but in 2008, you had liquidation event after liquidation event. Each was different, but the same. So please be careful and please do not assume that because ETH collateralizes the various things, that that means you're safe in ETH or safe, you know, or, or there can't be a sequel to Luna, even if it's totally different. All right. Some math. Uh, ARC is the altcoins of the stock market. Okay. ETH is the top altcoin of the crypto market. Okay. ARC, the altcoin of the stock market has gone so down so much. It's 63% below its July lows. That's the top right. So it was at 113 in July of 2021. It went to 42. That's a decline of 63%. In July of 2021, ETH was at 1706. So jump a column. If ETH goes down 62%, like ARC, the level for ETH is 1050. It's, I'm not hating on anything. This is just altcoin versus altcoin. Equities versus stocks, right? MicroStrategy, July low, 472. Current price, 208. Decline of 57%. Why MicroStrategy? Well, they have a lot of Bitcoin, right? It's like billions of it with borrowed money. Okay, so Bitcoin in July of 2021 was 29,300. So if Bitcoin winds up 57% below that, it's 18,640. I mean, what's the difference between MicroStrategy and Bitcoin, really? Other than MicroStrategy has a software company. They own so much Bitcoin. Either MicroStrategy has to go up or ARK has to go up or the cryptos have to go down. Now, it'd be awesome if the equities went up because then again, we could all just breathe easy. I could change out of these red shirts. I've got six of them. Okay, oil, to add to the fun. <laughs> oil and Bitcoin, if oil's up, Bitcoin's down. It's kind of from a mathematical study we did last year. So oil is now above 109. I've been talking about this. This structure would indicate that if oil is above 109, it can go to 125. And if it's above 125, it can go to 156 or 162. Okay. That's $10 gasoline in the United States from July 4th. I know. It's not pretty. So with that said... Just remember, go back to yesterday's video, watch the prayer of the sheepdog. We are here to keep you out of trouble. That's my job. Now I will turn this over to my colleagues from research, right? And what they're going to do is they're going to give you the hope, right? They're going to show you where to invest and what to look at, what homework you can do and how to understand what's going on now. So Mehdi, over to you, man. How, how do you want to do this today? Yeah, um, let's just start with some of the interesting projects. Um, at least on the music NFT side. So let's start, let's segue to Jacob and then after Chase, because Chase might have something interesting for us coming from OpenSea side. Um, so over to, you, over to you guys. Awesome. Hey everyone, thanks for joining the live stream. And today I wanna to talk about music NFTs. So if you've been following the NFT market, you'll know that this is one of the new emerging narratives um, and NFTs are great in a bear market because it allows you to connect with your favorite creators and 
the utility that they provide lasts more than just it it's worth more than just a trade you get access to their to backstage at their concerts you get access to future music drops um so music music nft are um what exactly are music nfts an artist or musician they sell their their soundtracks their their actual song, maybe an album as an nft allows their fans to own their music and not only own their music but also get royalties from their music um and why is this important well i think we can look at kind of some web 2 music stats and then you'll see kind of why music nfts also give power back to the artists and the creators um so let me share my screen and we can look at some stats so we can look at Spotify. So Spotify pays between 0 0.003 cents and 0 0.005 cents per stream. So that means that artists need at least 200 streams on one song to make one dollar. Apple Music paid an average of 0 0.01 cents per stream in 2021. And Rolling Stone reports that 1% of artists on Spotify receive 90% of all streams and only the top 0.8% of these artists make an average of 50,000 per year from streaming. So that's not a lot of money. Um, and not only are these artists not making a lot from their streams, their music labels are taking a lot of money as well. So we know NFTs give power back to the creators, back to the artists, and music NFTs are a perfect example of this. Um, let's look at one platform called Royal. Royal is a platform that allows artists um, to sell their sell their music as NFTs. They use Royal to share a portion of their streaming royalties um, with their fans, as well as allowing their fans to be owners of their music. Um, so if you buy a music NFT on Royal, You'll get exclusive access to streaming rights that generate income for you as a holder, as well as certain benefits that the artist promises. Um, we can look at a perfect example of this. So famous DJ Diplo and the end of March launched one of his single called Don't Forget My Love with Miguel. Um, and we can look at kind of what it sold for and what... Uh, benefits a holder got from it so there was three different tiers the gold platinum and diamond if you bought a gold tier which there was two thousand of those two thousand tokens for 99 dollars, you got 0 0.004 percent ownership of the song as well as access to their private discord if you paid almost a thousand dollars you got first dibs on the next diplo drop exclusive diplo dj music and as well as the Discord channel. And lastly, if you pay $10,000, you get guest list pass for any for one Diplo show per year up until 2023, as well as first dibs, exclusive music, and access to the uh, Royal Collector Discord channel. So these were all sold out. Um, they offered an ownership of 20% of his songs, and they raised $400,000. So if we look back at these streaming these streaming revenue he definitely would not make four hundred thousand dollars from dropping this on spotify or apple music as well as if he did his music label would take a huge cut in this instance he got to take back the power make four hundred thousand dollars and give his fans access to his music and royalties and another great benefit too is if uh, one of his fans is a also a music creator and they own one of these nfts that gives them ownership, IP rights to this music that allows them to remix it. They can really, really do anything they want with the music. They can make a remix. They can take kind of certain samples of the song and not have to worry about getting an IP claim or getting copyrighted because they're now an owner of the music. We can take a look at OpenSea for this. The floor price is 0 0.065 ETH. So that's for the gold one, the cheapest one. We can sort by tier, look at platinum, and the floor price is, once it loads, 
uh, 0.7 ETH and Diamond, which was the $10,000 plan or tier, there's none being sold. So there, there's none available. Um, so this is something really cool. I'm going to see this is definitely going to be a trend in the future. Um, this, we, we love to, like, the point of crypto is is to give the layperson back power, take power back from corporations, from banks, et cetera. And it, it's it's kind of, it's it's monetary empowerment. And this is a great example of this. Small artists can now make a lot more money by selling their music as NFTs. And then it, it's a win-win. The, the musician makes a lot more money and the fans get to interact directly with their favorite musicians. They get to own some rights of their songs and also own royalties of the songs and potentially remix their songs without having any problem. The only thing, only person it's screwing over is the music labels and the corporations, which doesn't sound so bad to me. So yeah, I, this is definitely a trend in music NFTs. I know some NFTs are controversial because people look at them, oh, what is this weird cartoon JPEG? It gives nothing to the holder. But there are some NFTs that have a lot of utility, such as music NFTs. So these, this is definitely a, a trend that we're going to see more. Um, and I think Royal is a great uh, platform to do so. And I will throw it back to the rest of the research, research team. Uh, thank you for being on this live stream. Make sure to hit like if you like music NFTs. I think you're muted, Maddie. All right, I'm still not hearing Maddie. I'll yeah, uh, I'll yeah, Chase, let's let's hear hear your 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 side <laughs> so of the NFTs. Get started. So um, today I'm going to be talking about a big new and recent announcement from OpenSea. That's obviously the NFT marketplace giant on Ethereum, which recently started supporting Solana NFTs. Their new announcement is they will be launching something called Seaport Protocol, uh, which is a open source web three marketplace for efficiently buying selling and trading nfts so essentially the the biggest can you, can you hear announcement me? yeah we can hear you Matty. so there's a few big things coming out of this announcement namely uh seaport will allow buyers and sellers to not only trade, uh, buy and sell NFTs using ETH, you'll also be able to use other NFTs, other cryptocurrencies, other ERC-20s, and also ERC-1155, which some people refer to as semi-fungible tokens. So for example, I could be selling a Bored Ape for 100 ETH, and I could accept an offer from someone that was a 60 ETH crypto punk and 40 ETH worth of uni token or link token, or it could be, you know, a 40 ETH doodle, this, that, or the other. I can also set the protocol to just automatically accept an offer that contains certain NFTs. So I can set my own price of 40 ETH, or I can set, I want an NFT of this collection. You can even narrow it down just to specific traits. You could say, I want a board ape that has laser eyes and I'll accept any board ape with laser eyes for my crypto punk, or I'll accept an alien crypto punk for my gold fur board ape. So I find that to be really, really interesting. It's something that when we talk about NFTs as collectibles, collectibles like Pokemon cards and baseball cards, they're very, very often traded. So I think this is a very natural uh, iteration to an NFT marketplace. There's a few other advancements that Seaport's making above OpenSea. One is OpenSea will not own the protocol. It's open sourced. It's able to be built by other developers, other interfaces can use 
the seaport protocol as their own nft marketplace uh you'll be able to tip a seller so you can have an offer and then you can throw in a tip OpenSea has said that this is going to be a good way for other nft applications to take some sort of fee through a tip uh, additionally the way the code is written uh it's believed that gas fees will be slightly less obviously once we have eth2 hopefully this will be much less of an issue nonetheless very exciting uh protocol out of OpenSea. and if there are any developers out there they're actually offering for the next eight days and some change anyone who's able to go in and find some level of vulnerability in the smart contract code uh there's a one million dollar prize pool so you'll be given varying levels of prizes depending on the level of vulnerability you find in the smart contract code so they're doing somewhat of a uh a community audit community smart contract audit it was also audited by trail of bits i should add as well as open zeppelin looked at the application itself uh yeah so that's seaport protocol i'll go ahead and pass it on to medi yeah um interesting to see different types of innovations happening in nft marketplace right like you have music nfts you have new type of nfts where uh, you have this like semi semi fungibility uh, i was reading this article a few days ago by vitalik uh, he, he he wrote a white paper of 29 pages like I just skimmed through it. So he's proposing an idea of uh, soul bound tokens, which will, which are basically like NFTs, but are non-transferable. So basically he imagines uh, where, let's say our university, our university degrees or our national identity card, or let's say our employment history could be sold dropped into our wallet as, as NFTs, which cannot be sold, which cannot be transferred, but they can act as, as, as a key mechanic for, for us to kind of own our identity. So very interesting development happening. Um, before my mic stopped working, I had one question for Jacob actually. Yeah. So Jacob, um, so so you kind of presented few music NFTs. Let's say if you were given a few million dollars, like like what what music NFT entices you, and, and like what are some of the NFTs you'll, you'll go out there and, and buy at, at current moment? Yeah. So for music NFTs, none of my favorite artists have started doing that yet. I see in the future they will, but at this point I probably wouldn't buy any music NFTs because I think the main value add is for you to connect with your creator and get these benefits such as backstage passes. I don't see them as much as turning a 3x profit, a 5x profit. Um, I mean, as you saw on OpenSea with the Diplo NFTs, they all of the prices were more expensive than the Mint, so everyone did make money from it. However, not that much money, and thats I don't think that's why collectors are buying these. So for me personally, I probably wouldn't dive into any music NFTs right now. Plus, the liquidity yeah, isn't, the, is, isn't the best. Um, but I, I do think it's a great innovation, and I do think it's its a narrative that we will continue to see growing in the next couple of years. Makes sense. Uh, yeah. Say, for me, I'm not a big uh, EDM guy, but... For whatever reason, DJs, the Chain Smokers, Diplo, Blau has a music NFT launching on Royal pretty soon. Uh, for whatever reason, DJs and EDM artists seem to be the first to uh, hop on this wave. The first traditional artist to hop onto the music NFT wave. Yeah, I, I can kind of imagine them. Let's say if if some of the users go on and buy those music nfts i can kind of think about soul 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 bond tokens being airdropped to them as like first loyal buyers of these nfts perhaps that could be one nice interesting experiment um before we before i just get uh, too ahead of myself why don't we segue to dennis and dennis can um, bring us back to reality and and we can we can talk about current state of DeFi market Dennis, I feel like you're on you're muted, Dennis. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we still can't hear you. Um, whilst, whilst Dennis uh, perhaps uh, fixes his microphone like myself, 
uh, I will perhaps jump into Hive Mapper. So even though at, at, at current times, uh, crypto is kind of bit tricky to navigate, like we have this recession risk, we have this stagflation risk, we have all, all kinds of risk running in parallel. Uh, so one of the ways you can still play crypto is let's say rather than investing in crypto, just earning crypto for free. So in, in 2018, around 2018, 19, Ian brought us Helium, right? Like he was, he was one of the early adopters and early investors in Helium. And he was, he basically told everyone in, on YouTube how to play this. So there's one interesting project, which is very similar uh, to Helium. It's called Hive Mapper. And if you were a token metrics uh, customer, we highlighted this project three weeks ago. And, and, and within those three weeks, uh, the, the, the price of the camera that you need to own to mine those tokens have already gone up by $100. Uh, so another perk of why you should be a TM customer. Uh, so just let, I'll, I'll just uh, share my screen and, and, and basically uh, walk, walk you guys through what Hive Member does. So yeah. Hive Member, you have- Can you hear me now uh, just so I can quickly check? Yes, yes. All right, yes, great. Okay, I'll okay. come in after you, so go ahead. All right. So, so with Hive Mapper, you have this $549 camera, and there's another one which is slightly cheaper. Uh, you can use this camera to basically map out a decentralized uh, map. So at the moment, when you look at Google Maps, one 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 big issue is that that, ma that the mapping that happens uh, requires a lot of infrastructure. You have this Google cars with multiple cameras and one person basically running around the city to kind of capture the images. And these maps, typically take ages, if not years, like they take ages, like sometimes years to kind of update, especially in remote areas. So it's a very inefficient process. And also Google owns the map, right? If, if they want, they, they can basically not show you a particular region or or during times of crisis, their the server might, might be down for whatever reason. Um, there were some case studies in Ukraine, but the Google map service wasn't working. So, so again, uh, one of the ways to kind of solve that problem is through having a decentralized map that is not owned by a central entity. And this is where Hive Mapper comes in, right? So with Hive Mapper, you buy the camera, uh, you basically drive around and you earn these honey tokens. Now, one argument could be, let's say if I'm driving around and earn, earning honey tokens, what does the honey token utility is? Like, let's say if I earn it, I'll, I'll sell it. So, so since you are making the map, there is also a buyer for those tokens. So the buyers will need the token to basically access live images or the most updated images of a particular location. So this is where the utility of the token live, uh, lies. It's it, it's not just horrible tokenomics. And when when they basically use those tokens, those tokens gets burned. So you have this equilibrium where you have tokens that are being issued, but tokens also being burned, as people call in the API service to access the decentralized map. So they're, they're building this on Solana. Interesting project. And, and basically, um, in a few months, they're, they're doing a launch globally. Uh, I just also wanted to uh, show you guys. Yeah, so you have this uh, Hive Mapper Dash, which is 549, and you have a slightly cheaper version, which is uh, also 549, but it was slightly cheaper a few days ago. Um, so again, this just shows you some of the some of the things. Uh, what do you get in the box, and so on and so forth. So what I really liked about this, they have strong connection with Helium and Solana. So Amr Halim, who is the CEO and founder of uh, founder of Helium, sorry, um, he he is basically one of the advisors, and co-founder of Solana is also the advisors. Not only that, you have some key Web two players such as um, Jaren, who basically was a uh, Apple Map executive. He's also uh, kind of helping them out, and also board members of uh, uh, Twitter and CEO of the like, former CEO of Tinder uh, are kind of helping them out. Uh, interestingly, CEO of Zillow, Zillow also has a map service that where they kind of help them, um, where, where they can kind of help users kind of see images of different houses uh, in a very specialized way. It's also kind of consulting them. So they have a stellar team as well as stellar advisors and again, uh, great investors. And unlike, um, unlike buying the token directly, one of the best ways you can just earn it since if you drive a lot is just to buy this scam and, and just, just, uh, just go about it. Now, what are some of the future utilities I kind of see with this, right? At the moment, we're just buying it to kind of uh, do the road mapping, but I can kind of imagine going forward, people can use it to check weather, uh, check air pollution level, check whether um, uh, like can be used for delivery. So let's say if you have, have certain micro tasks, but let's say you want to move, uh, move one, one delivery from one area to another, 
basically the whole global network of this map can facilitate that. And also they're being built on top of Helium. So Helium will be their wireless telecom service that will basically um, power, power this uh, mapping services. So again, uh, complex drop-off drop off, pickup could be interesting uh, optionality. Commercial delivery could be interesting uh, uh, thing to do. Asset inventory count for, for public and private goods. So for example, uh, somebody can give you honey tokens if you go to a particular location to see if the public infrastructure is still in place or not and give your, leave out your reviews. Or, and same for private assets, right? Uh, let's say if you can go to a particular factory and see if, if, if everything is okay, if everything is, is working fine, and you kind of um, uh, do that by, by honey tokens. Similarly, there are a lot of locations, especially in emerging markets, where you have missing addresses. So you can go to a particular location and, and fill out the address or, or what have you and get paid for that. And, and yeah, so th there could be interesting application. And not to forget, since the camera are 4K resolution, you also get very high, high quality um, uh, camera service where, where the map, let's say when you're paying for the map service, you can see high fidelity images for your purposes. So again, very interesting project. Interestingly, this was a project that was first uh, brought to me by Chase, who is now, I think, moving, uh, moving to a place where you won't be driving much but if you have a car and if you drive please get this and then start earning some honey tokens uh, all right guys so that was it for my end I, I do see a i do see one question can i buy that que camera ever i live in uk yes you can i think uk you'll be able to um uh, you'll be able to easily access this camera just go on the website and 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 order it um yeah over to you, I Dennis. Buy a camera, Medi. I'm just gonna have uh, I'm gonna have a friend from home drive around with it, give him a cut <laughs> yeah, of the hunt. Yeah, yeah Medi. Do you have any idea if you like drive along, like if you're a commuter and you drive along the same route every day, like are you gonna be able to earn less over time? Like, is it yes. kind of the, the early drives yes. that are more more uh, yes. lucrative? Yes. So, so uh, they have these different services of coverage system. Even though you'll be earning some tokens since you're updating the map on a daily basis, but uh, they have this coverage system where, let's say, if, if you're driving in remote areas where nobody has traveled or nobody has driven before, obviously you get more tokens. But if there's a congested area where a lot of people are driving, of course, you'll, you'll earn less tokens. And in order to kind of decide that, they also have some complex um, curators that uses Helium wireless network to kind of see if what you guys are doing in terms of driving is, is, is matching uh, the algorithm on their back end. Cool. Uh, yeah. So uh, should we pivot over to some some thoughts about the DeFi landscape? Yes. All right. Let's do it. I'm glad that you guys can hear me now. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, let me know when you guys can see DeFi Llama. So uh, if we're looking at this number right here, total TVL, we are now at 134 billion in TVL right now. If we look at just a little while ago, you could say that we were roughly double that. <laughs> so not really great. As somebody that spends a lot of time in the DeFi space, you hate to see half of the TVL going down. But you also have to ask yourself, uh, wh wh what does this number mean? What, what does it mean to lose 50% of our TVL? So uh, kind of to reflect back on what Bill said right at the very beginning, when we're in kind of this like bear market or you know sketchy market situations where people are spooked people don't really want to invest like the best thing to do with your time is not to like update your charts every five minutes but it's probably to like either learn a new skill and build something or educate yourself and uh that way when the next kind of when this market's over things are more positive you have new skill set you can invest better smarter and that's kind of my philosophy in these kind of in these tough times. So what I wanted to do is just talk about one angle of DeFi that is very prevalent, TVL. TVL shows up in kind of every protocol, but I wanted to kind of give you guys just a, a couple tools to add to your toolbox on how to create a framework to think about what TVL is. Like like to analyze whether this 50% decline, whether this is doomsday or whether this maybe actually isn't so bad. So I want to try to take a more objective point of view and take a look at some numbers. So 
uh, what I wanted to do to facilitate this was I created a very simple Excel and a couple scenarios to walk us through in an imaginary simple protocol that we can all kind of learn from. And if somebody ever well, that, that's up here wants to ask some clarifying questions, just hop right in. But I, I think that this will be really illustrative. So stick with me. Maybe we can all learn something together. So we're looking at scenario A. There's a small little lending protocol that somebody just started that accepts Ethereum as collateral. You can only deposit Ethereum. And if you do, you can you know, take a loan out on some stable coins. So to, to take a look at what is the TVL of our little protocol, well, what is, you have to look at what is the current price of ETH and how much Ethereum am I locking up? Like how much, how many, you know, whether it's a thousand people that each put in one Ethereum or whether it's just one guy that just threw a thousand Ethereum into it. This is how we find the TVL of the protocol, right? If, if Ethereum's at 2000 and a thousand people lock it up, you're going to have a TVL of 2 million. And now we have to ask ourselves, let's do some scenario analysis. What happens if Ethereum falls 25%? So nobody touched their money. Everybody still deposited their Ethereum in the collateral inside of the protocol, but Ethereum falls 25% and that hits the TVL because the TVL is a reflection of the collateral's price. So you could see that there's no change in sentiment in the protocol. Everybody, nobody touched their money, but Ethereum fell. Now there's kind of the flip side of that. What if the price of Ethereum doesn't move at all, but people start feeling worse about the protocol, right? And then uh, let's say a quarter of the people just take their Ethereum out. They no longer want to borrow on this protocol. Well, that'll actually affect the TVL the exact same way, right? So when we're looking at this big decrease in TVL, like in DeFi as a whole, it's really important for us to ask one more question, which is which of these two causes is actually contributing to the decline in TVL. Because as you can imagine, if both of these things happen, then you see a much bigger decline. So what I wanted to do is just shed a little bit of light kind of on this part of how uh, TVL works. So if we pop back to this chart, uh, the closest comparison to our little mock protocol is probably Maker because Maker, uh, you deposit, well, in the old days, you deposited Ethereum. Now they accept a basket, but like you deposit that and you create DAI. That's that's what Maker is for. And we can see that in the last month, uh, Maker is down 31.5%. But if you look at what Ethereum has done in that same time, in the last 30 days in the last month, Ethereum is down 37.2%. So one of the arguments that I'm actually making here is that people aren't necessarily running out of every DeFi protocol. Like what's actually happening is the collateral is being marked down in value. And it's being marked down in value by people that are not even necessarily participating in the collateral itself. Uh, so this is just something to, to really think about as we as we look at the landscape. And in reality, it's probably a combination of the two. There's definitely some people that are saying, I don't really want to be in DeFi anymore, but also a lot of it is the general market selling off and pulling all of these prices down. So to kind of highlight that a little bit further, uh, especially because earlier on Bill mentioned Aave, I just wanted to show you guys a quick snapshot of what Aave is looking like right now. So you can kind of see that the rates to borrow on Aave are pretty low, right? Like you could get DAI at three-ish percent. And you can see here that 10 million people are have supplied uh, any sort of collateral and only 3 million people have actually taken them up on it. Like a lot of people are just too spooked to borrow. Like there's there's money on the table and people are not taking it. And as a result, since since people aren't actually borrowing, like these these borrow rates have just kind of come down. And then and because nobody's really borrowing, that pushes the supply rates down. So we are kind of seeing this general bit of just kind of slight confidence shake. But I think a lot of it is coming from higher level kind of market trends and also really poor timing with 
kind of current market conditions and the whole Luna thing, right? Like it's kind of for DeFi, it's kind of a double whammy because we're getting hit on both sides of it. Uh, and to that point, uh, kind of if people had Luna's kind of 19.5% APR as the status quo in their mind, like you really have to <laughs> move on from that and realize that the rates that are actually available now that that is out of the picture are looking pretty different and closer to these kinds of numbers. So these are just some thoughts on where we are on a higher level. And I still did want to share one more brand new protocol that's being developed right now that I think could be pretty interesting. Uh, in a couple months, uh, it's still being built. It's kind of an alpha testing right now. But uh, once again, kind of when more of this blows over, when confidence and enthusiasm starts coming back, if you've been taking this time to do your research, you can be an early mover in these protocols and it could it could potentially be pretty good for you. So, yeah, yeah. Just to yeah. just to give them uh, give our audience some clarity, uh, yeah. and you, you can move on to that project in a bit, uh, Dennis. I just want to segue into this part. I just uh, I just found this interesting charts from Dropsdap. Uh, so some of the projects that I had on my mind that I thought could be listed by Binance, I just want to show everybody at what ROI they are trading versus uh, the market cap or, or or valuation some of the investors invested in. So just to give you some clarity, Covalent is trading at 0.43, lower than what uh, some of the investors bought. Same with uh, uh, one of the privacy coins called uh, NYM name. Uh, same with P-Stake. Uh, Melos is, is trading 3x because the valuation is still low. But you can see like how how like some of the good projects with amazing investors listed potential listing on Coinbase and Binance, trading at like single digit million million dollar valuations, and then also trading way below than what the VCs paid for. So if you guys do your research, and if you guys work, work hard during this time, you can you can actually become A16Z of your own portfolio. Uh, I'll, I'll say that's the, <laughs> that's one of the takeaway. So that, that, uh, that, um, that kind of makes me confident. So whatever Dennis, uh, whatever project Dennis kind of brought in, even though it's in the private market, if it launches during the bear market, you guys would be able to potentially buy it even below uh, the valuation that VCs paid for. Yeah. Yeah. That is, it, that is a crazy trend, right? The fact that like a lot of top notch projects are just at the same, at the same price, but you don't have to have your money locked up for three years. Right. I mean, yes. yes. So, so in the, the bull market, the, the issue was, uh, a VC would invest in and project would list even without any fundamental and it will do 30 X 20 X. Uh, and, and, and now the, uh, the, the, the issue is good VCs are invested project launches. It, it trades 30%, 40% of what it's actually invested in. So it kind of shows you to two spectrum, right? Two spectrum of the market. Uh, either it just rewards you a lot or it just punish you, punishes you, I guess, more than what's actually warranted. And that's what makes investing exciting. Like you buy the bottom, try to buy the bottom, and try to sell the top. Yep. At least you try. You tr we definitely, we all definitely try. Um, yeah. So what I wanted to do was talk about this new project that I came across called uh, called Brahma, and uh, this is a, a really cool project specifically because it ties into what we were just talking about about how yields are compressing a lot, right? Like you can't expect to get 19.5%, you know, risk-free or like, you know, stable coin yield, right? Like that, that, that is a, not kind of the reality anymore. And we should be thinking about opportunities that are actually available to us now. So uh, just, just for, I want to go over what this is because I found this to be really exciting. So what these guys do is... It's this really neat structure. They offer two products, either for, actually here, one sec, there's an even better one. So there's an Ethereum version and there's a USDC version. For both of these, you deposit either Ethereum or USDC because, you know, if you, if you feel good about Ethereum, right? Like, you know, no matter how bad this bear market is, I don't think Ethereum's just gonna say, well, I'm, I'm done, I give up, <laughs> I, I'm no longer a protocol. I think Ethereum will, will definitely make it kind of to the other side of this market. Uh, it's up to you, obviously, whether you want to trade it along the way, or if you just want to say, forget it, I'm just going to hold it. That's definitely up to everybody 
on their own. But if you are in the camp that says, I want to hold it and do something with it, uh, this is kind of one option that will be available to you when this product comes out of alpha. So alpha testing. So for both of these products, whether you're looking at Ethereum or USDC, uh, what happens is you deposit that into the protocol. And, and what the protocol does is they take that deposit here. Actually, there's a nice little picture. They take, they, they take your deposit and they put it into a yield aggregator on a very safe level. So just kind of, you know, just stable coin swaps or Ethereum for staked Ethereum, like the, the least kind of volatile stuff there is. They take the interest collected from that over the course of a week, and then they invest only the interest. So at no point is your actual collateral that you deposited being directly invested into anything. It's just being staked into kind of a no impermanent loss pool. So what happens is, you know, you deposit your USDC, it earns a little bit of yield. Let me just blow this up a little bit more. You deposit USDC, it earns a little bit of yield. And then what they do is they take that little bit of yield and just the yield gets put into a leveraged bet. So they kind of do some momentum analysis, decide whether the market's moving up or down, and then they put like a, a leverage long or short with only the interest. So the worst case scenario here is your interest gets liquidated, but your original capital was never touched because that is not invested. That's only yield farmed. So it's this so, so just to clarify, Dennis, yeah. is it like a hedge fund for your yield? So there is an external hedge fund. There's a manager that takes your yield and, and tries to take risky bet. Am I, am I reading this right? Yeah, yeah, sort of. And, you know, they try to automate as much of this as possible. They kind of have a machine learning thing of their own, which dictates whether they should make a longer or a short bet. And they're just kind of doing like an at the money call option, for example, or just like just buy perpetual long. Right. But yes, it's kind of it's kind of like this. Somebody is kind of analyzing the market and making a longer short bet on your behalf, but with only the interest. Right. And at any point, you can always just pull your initial capital back out. But the upside is that the interest because it's being put into leveraged bets actually has pretty interesting returns and they've kind of been doing models and on average, these things have been returning, you know, roughly 5% or 7% uh, APR. And this is interesting because it's a different source of yield, right? Like, like this is not an inflationary token that you're just kind of farming. And then as its value crumples, like this is, you're, you're basically investing and receiving yield from market volatility. And I think that these kinds of plays are going to be really interesting going forward, especially when your underlying capital is not at significant risk. And I always am trying to reframe it to myself that like five to 7% is pretty good. Even if you look at like your other stable coin options right now, right? If you're, if you're just trying to stake your USDC, like you're, you're even across different platforms and different chains, you're looking at two you know, 1.7, maybe 3% if you're willing to like move your USDC over to Avalanche and do it on Stargate, right? But like these are actual stable coin rates right now. So when a project comes along and is trying to figure out a really neat way for you to get five to 7%, I think it's worth paying attention to. And so finally, just kind of sharing where these guys are right now. They're still actively building and uh, they're, they're, they're getting their audits done because obviously you should make sure that protocols are audited before you actually put capital in it. They've actually already finished one audit and they're working on their second one and there will be a token coming. So, uh, it's definitely something to pay attention to in the future. And, and also if this does sound interesting and you're like, oh, okay, this kind of fundamentally conceptually makes sense to me, then. Uh, it pays to kind of get on their platform and just like join their discord and start messing around because there's this fun little karma system where they track your karma, which is just this untradeable resource. It's kind of funny because this almost ties back to uh, what you were talking about from, from Vitalik about this kind of like soul bound thing. They're kind of doing this own thing just based on their own protocol where, uh, as you engage in the community, as you participate and contribute, you start building karma. And karma is actually like what they use to like let in alpha and beta testers for their product. So if this all sounds exciting, mess around on their Discord, engage with the community, and 
you might build up some karma and be able to test out the product early. So I just thought this was really exciting and wanted to share it with everybody. Yeah, um, great, great presentation, Dennis. Um, really interesting, really, really interesting. Um, yeah, but I think the market will still take some time to get getting used to 5%, 7%. Definitely, uh, definitely. Yeah, one of the interesting trends I was just discussing uh, with my analysts and also Bill, traditional finance on your stable coin, which is USD, is now giving you more interest than let's say Coinbase and Aave for that matter for lending. So, so now we are in this scenario where traditional finance, because of high inflation and Fed uh, becoming hawkish, we might even have more interest uh, interest there. Uh, anyways, Mike, um, before we go back to Bill and before we just take further questions, man, what are you seeing in the private market? Like any interesting projects in the private market or some of the trends you are seeing in private market? Uh, uh, do cover it uh, with our audience. So just to give uh, give our audience a bit of a backdrop. Mike, um, basically throughout seven days, uh, just gets on calls with private projects that are not listed yet. And it's sort of like our venture analyst where he just tracks movement in, in the private market. Uh, so over to you, Mike. You're on mute, Mike. So I think you'll have to uh, rejoin the stream. Uh, so apologies for that, guys. Uh, we'll, um, we'll sort this before, before, before the next stream. Uh, sort this issue. So one of the questions I had was, Mehdi, can you drop a new, uh, drop a few hidden gems today? Again, not financial advice. There was a project called um, Octopus Network. Uh, so Octopus Network, when I covered it, was around $300, $400, uh, 300, 400 million valuation. Now it has gone down to 60 million valuation. It's one of the projects that you, if you're bullish on near and you're bullish on Polkadot simultaneously, you can, you can basically buy. So the way um, uh, Octopus Network works is any project that is being built on Polkadot can deploy on near protocol and they don't have to uh, go through the auction process. So that's one of the projects that I'm, I'm currently analyzing and uh, which I'm bullish on. Uh, so Mike, are you, are you with us now? Yeah, hopefully you guys can hear me now. Yeah, we still can't. Uh, no? Yeah, yeah, we can. Okay, okay, perfect. Yeah, so the private market, um, as I was saying when I was on mute, hasn't slowed down one bit. Uh, we're, we're still seeing you know, a lot of projects pop up. Uh, mainly, uh, we're seeing Web3 projects, you know, trying to facilitate the infrastructure growth on that side. And um, also, you know, DeFi projects are, are still coming up, which is very cool. Um, you know, seeing you know, DeFi's narrative still picking up and um, you know, traditional finance pivoting to the use case of uh, you know, decentralized finance. So one project I wanted to bring to you guys today and highlight, you know, it's potential down the road. Um, go ahead and share my screen here. The project is uh, ZK Lend. Uh, here's a website. So we were just talking a lot about Aave and, you know, the money markets, borrowing and lending side of things. Uh, ZK Lend is a new project that's, you know, coming uh, to this sector specifically, um, borrowing and lending, uh, similar use case to Aave. But what they're doing is more unique in the sense that um, you know, Aave is built on the base layer of Ethereum, uh, still very slow, and you know, sc the scalability of it is uh, still in progress. But this is being built out on Stark, Starkware, Starknet. Um, so Starkware, I'm going to give you guys an overview of what it is. Uh, so ZK Lend is an all-in all bet on uh, Ethereum's ecosystem, aims to bring more composability and more uh, users to the various dApps within you know Ethereum's ecosystem. And they plan on doing that by creating a better money, money market than Aave um, and Compound, for example. So why they're betting on Ethereum. Um, so this is built on top of Starkware and they're using Ethereum's superior security to become the new standard of permissionless and permission lending and borrowing. So a little bit different than Aave. And we'll go into how that is um, you know, as I move forward. Um, so Ethereum here, this is like a comparison of different um, blockchains, Avalanche, Ethereum, Polygon, Fan. And Binance, um, so you could see, you know, Ethereum might be the cost, most uh, costly one, but with the average uh, block time and nodes validators, as well as the public sale allocation, and you know the specs of the validator requirements, it's still the most robust and decentralized, um, you know, network that um, exists. And, and we're still obviously very bullish on it, and 
this project is a bet on that much like um, Matic was a bet on Ethereum in you know, 2019, 2020 for scaling. Um, so why is your knowledge? Uh, Vitalik, you know, the founder of Ethereum, uh, spoke about it and said that we need zero knowledge. So this is a quote from him. Uh, in general, his, his opinion is in that in the short term, optimistic rollups are likely to win out for EVM computation. The ZK rollups are going to win out for simple payments, exchange, and other application use cases. But in the medium to long term, ZK rollups will win in all you know use cases as the technology improves. So what is ZK? It's a zero knowledge proof method where a, a party, a prover, and another party can verify a statement is, is true without having to you know, get all the nodes uh, within all this 5,000 nodes to validate one uh, transaction. They could just do it by a two. Uh, uh, so this is going to increase scalability, you know, tenfold, uh, to say the least, maybe thousandfold uh, as it moves forward um, and inherently re relies on hash functions. So ZK Stark stands for zero knowledge, scalable, transparent, transparent arguments of knowledge. And some protocols are using it, Starkware, StarkX, MutableX, this is one of the first protocols, DYDX, StarkNet, and Polygon Maiden. Polygon's in a few um, you know, baskets when it comes to scalable uh, technology. They, they have ZK rollups, optimistic rollups. Uh, so, so you know, very interesting to see that Polygon is betting on this as well. Some pros, it's quantum resistant, uh, less resistant to collision hashes, which is uh, you know, the chance to be attacked. And um, there's vocal support from the Ethereum Foundation, and it scales up the, the computational speed of Ethereum inherently. So ZK Lend is using Starkware, which is ZK, uh, ZK rollups, to build borrowing and lending protocol with the utmost security and lowest fees. This is via you know, Ethereum's robustness. And the way they're doing this is first, they're going to be launching the Artemis uh, permissionless side of things. So this is going to be very similar to Aave, where you could borrow, lend, and um, you know, receive those high APY APRs that you're keen on. Uh, but you know, down the line, they're also going to be launching Apollo, which is going to be an institutional, uh, institutional focused um, borrowing and lending market. So we could see, you know, this project compete with Aave as well as like Maple Finance going down, uh, you know, further down the future, just because of the fact that it's, uh, you know, attacking these. Uh, borrowing and lending markets in multiple angles. But yeah, this is just uh, one project I wanted to bring to you guys. It has a little bit better tokenomics than Aave as well, revenue sharing, emission rewards, and governance rights. Uh, mainly Aave is just providing governance right now. So one project I just wanted to bring to you guys and uh, hopefully Thank you. provide some more information further. Thank you, Mike. So, so definitely the future is L2s. And one of the biggest infrastructure player of L2s is Stockware. Stockware is basically building zero knowledge proof uh, uh, layer twos uh, and rollups. And over there, interesting applications will be built. And this is one of them, which will be like an Aave uh, for one of the L2s. So thank you, Mike, for bringing that project up. Uh, I, I hope uh, users will appreciate when this project is launched in six months time. And we can perhaps re-air your video that you bought this project six months before any analyst was covering that. So before we head to our conclusion, I know you guys, uh, I'm cognizant of your guys' time. I just wanted to quickly share this uh, uh, thing with you. I was just uh, alluding to earlier. Uh, can you guys see my screen? Yep. So, so I was reading this report, and this is very fascinating, and I think Bill will agree. Um, you over here, you see a few things. Uh, you see stable coins such as DAI, uh, Binance US dollars, uh, USDC, and USDT. And on our way, you are seeing 2%, 0.9%, 1.4%, 1.4%. .4%. Now, the reason why USDT has 2% is there is slightly higher risk. Around 9%, around 9 to 15% of USDT portfolio is in riskier asset, like either crypto or, or some, of the, um, some of the credit. So market are slightly assigning slightly higher yield for that. Whereas in case of USDC, you have 95%, 96% cash backing. And with DAI and BSUSD, you have similar kind of setting with DAI being more over colored to us. Now, what's more interesting is FX market, market uh, uh, if, if you're into futures, is basically telling you all the currencies that are pegged by USD, if you buy the futures contract, <laughs> you'll get higher yield than let's say USDT and USDC. 
and and uh, just for some understanding hong kong dollar and saudi saudi peg has has literally been um, one of those strongest pegs that have been deep peg so so with these pegs you're also earning higher interest and then also us money market um, you can see us t bills uh, and 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 usd credit default swaps and things like that uh, us money markets are also giving you higher uh, higher yield. i'm not sure what usd cp a1 and a2 are uh, but That's again commercial uh, paper commercial paper okay yeah. uh, can you can you elaborate on that dennis i'm, I'm not aware of that yeah, for sure. That's actually uh, what we talked a little bit about last week when we were looking at what's kind of under the guts of Tether. Uh, commercial paper is just kind of shorter term loans to businesses. Okay. So a a a is a higher rating, but, uh, you know, yeah. So is that yes. A1 and, M and A2 in reference to like M1 and M2? You know, you know I'm referring no, to? Not M1 and M2. Those are money supply. These are like money markets, like a very liquid three months treasury. Uh, notes mm -hmm. that you can basically hold and, and basically assume it's cash. But what's interesting is traditional finance, because of what's hap what has happened in in few days, is giving you better yield. And that kind of shows to me that um, there's a lot of pain to come. There is a lot of pain to come, and I, I think Bill will be in 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 agreement on on what's transpiring. Um, yeah, I'll stop stop sharing screen now. Thank you guys. All right, gentlemen. Thank you. Uh, I think one of the things that's really interesting is that, you know, in, in legacy, right, you can get a 3% yield, let's see, a 30 year bond, which can benefit from a tough fed, right? The fed keeps tightening, but the economy slows down. You can hold a long bond, which is risky you can get 3% and you may get capital appreciation because as rates, as long-term rates fall, because bonds, long bonds love, you know, Fed hiking rates with slow economy. So can you imagine with the size of the give up trade that you've seen in long bonds, what would happen if you actually got a rally in legacy, if bond yields started dropping? you could get roughly 3% and capital appreciation. So I don't know what that means for DeFi. I just know that, you know, the world of interest rates went from being surreal in legacy and now it's surreal in DeFi. So is it over? Like, is the pain over in DeFi or is it just starting? We don't know. But what we do know is token metrics customers get access to these analysts at detailed webinars once a week, right? They also get access to our markets page on our website, as well as a version of altcoin overtime, which we do on the market update. Now today we had deluxe version of altcoin overtime with my colleagues. So gentlemen, any, any final words? Yes, it, it was a pleasure uh, just giving the analysis. Uh, brainstorming with, with the other analysts it was fun uh i'm tomorrow i'm getting a very special guest from traditional finance on 100x show his name is bilal hafiz he was my former boss and uh he has he was a global head of research in in, in jp morgan deutsche bank and uh, and namura so he'll be coming in and basically uh guiding us uh in terms of how to navigate the current global macro environment also how to navigate like its views on crypto he's at the moment neutral which is very interesting and long term, he's bullish. So, so that will be very interesting to kind of pick his brain. So, I'll do, I, I do, um, I do recommend everybody who tunes in either tomorrow or Monday to watch that episode to kind of be like a beacon light, to kind of like a guiding light on how to navigate the current markets. And the portfolio construction he'll give will be wider than crypto. So, stay tuned for that. Okay, gentlemen. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us out there in the audience. We appreciate you, Token Metrics customers, tokenmetrics.com for the best research and portfolio insurance in the business. You can be your own hedge fund, and the best time to prepare is when the market's going lower. So for the market update, Hidden Gems Edition, I'm your host, Bill Noble. We will see you soon.